Good afternoon and welcome to the Washington Institute. I'm Rob Satloff, the director of the Institute, and I'm thrilled to welcome you all to this very special event. Uh, looking around the Arab-Israeli arena, there hasn't been a lot of good news lately. Uh, of course, uh, Israel and Hamas just waged a violent conflict last month. Um, this follows years of stalemated um, peace diplomacy between Israelis and Palestinians more generally. Um, uh, we see in some countries around this arena some truly horrific images and stories, obviously um, out of Syria, for example, and then more recently and perhaps so saddenly from Lebanon. Um, uh, there are, however, some sparks um, of, uh, of good news um, uh, uh, on in the Arab-Israeli arena. Um, uh, uh, one of them is that on the state-to-state -state level, some Arab states in Israel are beginning the process of, 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 of having full diplomatic relations. Perhaps even more importantly is that on a popular level, some Arabs and some Israelis are overcoming some of the decades of hesitation to build people-to-people -people relations. And this, of course, is the basis on which real change can be established. Uh, but even at this time when there is, um, when there is such, um, uh, uh, such difficulty faced internally and regionally, some are putting up huge obstacles and asking people to pay terrible prices for even this people-to-people -people contact. Um, just today, there was an announcement that the Tunisian uh, parliament is considering a law uh, criminalizing normalization. We saw this in Kuwait. Um, just uh, a few weeks ago. And perhaps um, uh, uh, most um, uh, strongly, this anti-normalization effort is in Lebanon, where um, uh, the regime and uh, uh, backed by, of course, Hezbollah, is um, eager to, um, to penalize people um, for having contact, for Isra Lebanese who have contact with Israelis, perhaps even some of the 300,000 Lebanese who are around the Middle East, such as in Abu Dhabi and Dubai, um, which is now um, uh, the Emirates, where uh, normalization between the Emirates and Israel is occurring. Perhaps those 300,000 Lebanese there will fall victim to the anti-normalization vendetta of Hezbollah and its allies in Lebanon. So today's event um, is really an opportunity for us to take a close look at this phenomenon, using the legal system to try to stop people-to-people -people contact, and even try to punish people who may have incidental contact with Israelis, which is the possibility in a place like, like Abu Dhabi and, and Dubai. I'm, I'm thrilled that we have um, such an outstanding panel of, uh, of uh, public intellectuals um, um, uh, to discuss this, uh, this critical topic. Um, I'm going to introduce them uh, uh, and, and turn the podium over to, um, uh, over to my friend Joseph Browdy uh, in just a moment. Um, uh, but let me first introduce Nadim Kotesh. Nadim is a renowned Emirati-based political analyst and satirist. He hosts Tonight with Nadim, a daily news and commentary show on Sky News Arabia. I'm delighted that he's joining us. Majd Harb, an attorney and legal activist in Beirut. Um, he's actually had the courage to take his bullet to court, accusing the party of money laundering, customs law evasion, and other criminal offenses. I'm delighted that you could join us, uh, Majd. And then, of course, um, uh, my colleague, uh, Hanin Ghadar. Hanin is the Friedman Fellow here at the Washington Institute, former managing editor of now Lebanon, uh, and Hanin, of course, is, has faced this, uh, this challenge personally and directly, um, uh, and I'm delighted that she's joining us to, to speak about this and what steps we can take to go forward. Um, I've asked Joseph Browdy, who's the president of the Center for Peace Communications, um, which hosts the Salem Initiative, um, uh, a project devoted to protecting um, uh, Arab civil peacemakers engaged in people-to-people -people contact with Israelis. I've asked Joseph to, to moderate this event. Just for all of our attendees, we're going to turn to you to participate. All of you participants 
on the various platforms, whether it's Zoom or Facebook Live or YouTube. We ask you to participate in this event today as well. Um, uh, you'll have the opportunity to, to address questions to our panelists. Um, if you're on Zoom, uh, please put your questions in the Q&A function that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. If you're on some other platform, please feel free to email your questions to the following address, policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. That's one word, policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. Again, I want to thank uh, Nadim, Majd, Hanin, and Joseph, and I'm going to turn the floor over to Joseph Browdy. Thank you, Rob. Thanks for those introductions and uh, for so nicely setting the table. Indeed, these anti-normalization laws, which are found across uh, the Arab Middle East and have been around for 70 years, um, are, are a major hindrance to Arab-Israeli engagement. And from what we've seen over the past year as voices across the region call for that type of engagement and actually begin to do it, uh, there are a whole lot of people who are unhappy about these laws. There might be an even larger number of people uh, who are less than thrilled about them, regardless of their views about Israel. Because in an interconnected world, these laws are increasingly difficult to avoid uh, violating. Uh, and we're gonna learn more about that in a moment. We're gonna do two lightning rounds with our distinguished experts. Uh, and I'd like to start with Majd Harb uh, from Beirut, distinguished lawyer in Lebanon who really knows this law backwards and forwards. Majd, if you could tell us, what is this law? And uh, how does it work? Um, how is it enforced? And who ends up finding themselves in the crosshairs of it? Hi, Joseph. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, let's start by saying that it's not a single law. It's basically three laws that are linked and uh, very linked together. It's the code, Nice Criminal Code. It's the law of 1955, and it's the Code of Military Justice. Um, basically, any type of contact between a Lebanese national and anyone uh, um, moral or, or a physical person residing in Israel uh, is sanctioned by these laws. The sanctions can range from three months imprisonment up to a death sentence, basically. The biggest problem we have is that if you ask me how this law is being interpreted, how does it function, I have been working in legal compliance in Lebanon for up to 10 years, and I can't give you a straightforward answer. I don't know. It's so widely interpreted that every time we have a case relating to that matter, there's a different decision that comes out of the Lebanese courts. And this is the biggest problem we have. Uh, any type of contact can be construed as espionage and uh, can even be construed as high treason. Uh, basically, condemned, basically, you get the death, uh, death sentence because of it. Uh, and even the same type of contact can be neglected and the courts will not even uh, listen to your, uh, listen to you or, or check the facts if they are real or not. Um, so this is the biggest problem. The second problem with these laws is that they have been basically put in place in 1955 prior to globalization, prior to uh, social media, prior to the ease of contact, uh, cross-border contact, uh, and who's in the crosshairs? Every Lebanese citizen. Uh, before you get a friend request on Facebook, before you get a direct message, uh, you basically have to ask for an ID. Uh, this is the biggest problem we have of these laws. You can get in trouble for a simple text, for a simple message, that's the biggest problem there. Um, so, um, and there's another major problem there. The law doesn't take into account your state of mind. It, it, there isn't anything that talks about good faith. For example, Article 283 of the Criminal Code states that any person that comes in contact with an Israeli agent, assists him, offers him lodging, food, etc., gets convicted with a three-year sentence. But the law doesn't state if this person willingly offered assistance to a known Israeli agent or not. Any person can be construed as an Israeli agent, but, but we don't know that. 
So our intentions are not taken into account. Let's take, for example, a couple of examples that happened recently. For example, Kindal Khatib, who is a 21-year-old activist, uh, a young woman that came in, in contact with an Israeli journalist uh, on Twitter, who gave uh, an interview to that Israeli journalist, uh, was charged with high treason, uh, basically communicating uh, intelligence and information, which was basically information that was present on all news outlets uh, talking about the crisis in Lebanon. And she was charged with uh, three years hard labor. She served one year, thankfully, and she was let, uh, she was let go. A personal experience, on the other hand, was, was with a client of mine that owns a real uh, uh, a car rental agency in Cyprus that had rented a car, not to an Israeli national, but to someone who had connections with Israel. Once he came back to Lebanon, he was arrested, interrogated for long hours, uh, humiliated, but then let go with a simple fine of $100. On the other hand, you have several instances where ministers come into direct contact or even if you want to interpret the law vaguely as it's interpreted the negotiators in southern lebanon now uh, talking with the israelis about the border demarcation are breaking the law uh, the law is so vague it doesn't take into account uh, technological advances every single person residing in lebanon ha that have a facebook account that have any social media account are at risk of being prosecuted. Nadim, Hanin, anyone living abroad, anyone who has studied abroad are at risk of prosecution for a simple contact with any Israeli national or any Israeli company. I'm not advocating, I'm not advocating unconditional peace. I'm just saying that this law puts us all at risk on a daily basis. Let's say something and be clear about it, that Kinda was opposing Hezbollah. Hanin was opposing Hezbollah. I am opposing Hezbollah. Just like Kinda, we are all at risk. Nadim, everybody knows how, how much he's opposing Hezbollah. We are all at risk on a daily basis because of that law and because of the vague interpretation, uh, which is basically isn't compliant with basic human rights. Criminal law should be detailed. We should know when we are breaking the law and when we are not breaking the law. Prior to coming on to that panel, I sent Hanin around 10 emails. Basically, I'm living in Lebanon and I'm on risk. I sent Hanin dozens of emails just asking her to uh, make sure that none of the panelists are Israeli and I'm not at risk of prosecution. So, <laughs> indeed. And thank you, Maj. And by the way, for any viewers anywhere in the world, including Lebanon, allow me to respond to, to Maj and uh, just emphasize that uh, no Israelis are involved in this program in any way, directly or indirectly. And so no one is legally exposed um, on this panel. Um, Maj, thank you for uh, walking us through that. I'd like to turn to Nadim. Uh, star of, uh, of Arabic television and well-known across the region and a Lebanese voice who lives in the safety of Abu Dhabi, where uh, uh, beyond the arm of the law, if you will, uh, in Lebanon. But, and yet, Nadim, 300,000 Lebanese live in uh, the UAE and Bahrain, two countries that are now at peace with Israel and teeming with Israelis. Um, and you've said that this law in distant Lebanon somehow has an impact on them as well. So if you could kindly explain to us, um, you know, what does this law do to Lebanese re residing in the Gulf? Hanin, you look like you're uh, trying to say something. I can't hear you because you're on mute. No, Nadim is muted. Nadim, can you hear us? He's muted. Um, okay, now I'm fine. Oh, great. Welcome. Okay. Yeah, I muted myself and then I forgot to unmute. So uh, I was saying thank you, Joseph and uh, Rob and Hanin for arranging this and thanks for much for the uh, um, the insights he just provided. Actually, uh, Nadim, the direct... point, if, are you able to activate your video as well? Because we can't see you. Why? I mean, my, my camera is... Uh, that's weird. Stop. stop. Okay. You can see me now. There yeah. we go. Now we see you clearly. Go ahead, Nadim. 
Okay, let me start from the beginning then. I was saying thank you for Rob and Joseph and Hanin for uh, you know arranging this and thanks for much for the insights he provided on about the law. Actually, answering your question about uh, how this will implicate the Lebanese is is not. Uh, 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 an easy task, as Majd just stated, it's a very vague law, it's very uh, generic, very general, uh, and you basically uh, don't know exactly what amounts for uh, a breach of the law or what doesn't amount for a breach of law. Uh, he, he mentioned the, the uh, basically the, uh, the idea of double standards applied in the application of this law. For example, Jubran Basil, in one of the, the, the Lebanese foreign minister, in one of the functions, he was standing side by side with Benjamin Netanyahu in Paris after the Charlie Hebdo episode. He was not uh, tried, he was not uh, abducted, he was not arrested, nothing, of, he was not fined even. So basically, uh, it's obviously that what applies to others doesn't apply to other Lebanese. Uh, and and you you never know where, where are the limits of legitimacy or illegality of your actions. Having that said, uh, and mentioning Abu Dhabi in particular, Joseph, it's very important because the Abraham Accords are not like the prior agreements in the 70s between Egypt and, and Israel or between Jordan and Israel or the Palestinians and Israel. It's not the uh, the sort of cold agreements that took place uh, on the government-to-government -government basis. Uh, both parties, the Israelis and the Emiratis, are keen on enhancing and deepening the relations across all sectors, commercial, uh, uh, trade, um, um, innovation, education, uh, and you name it. Like, like the sky is the limit for, for, this, for this accord. And both parties are um, blunt, and, and enthusiasts about, about where they want to take it. This has a profound impact on everyone living in, the, in this region and who is part of you know, the, 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 business, the business or the, or the uh, education scene uh, in, in the UAE and Bahrain. And Lebanese in particular are not basically with the set of skills they have a uh, major slice of them, they, they, are, they occupy leading roles in these companies. This has been the case for decades and, and uh, um, it, it has been a privilege, but now it's like kind of liability. Uh, these are not like, you know, um, low level employees who can uh, evade the communication with the Israelis. These, most, most of them or a uh, major part of them uh, they occupy leading roles in their companies. And as you know, and probably as our audience don't know, uh, the, in the UAE, they are enacting anti-discrimination and anti-racism laws, which make it illegal to stipulate uh, 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 the exclusion of, of um, any nationality, of any religion, of any race. Uh, and that applies basically to the Israelis. So when you are working in a company and you want to apply by two things the the anti-racism laws of the uae and the implications of the peace deals between the israelis and the emiratis you are you are basically uh, in, in between a uh, rock and the hard place uh, you either uh, you either sacrifice your job going back to the flourishing uh, lebanon uh, <laughs> or you basically uh, abide by the law of the UAE and then risk going back home or risk being, uh, 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 even without going back home. I mean, you can be uh, tried on absentia and this has so much implication on your uh, fortune in Lebanon. If you have a house, if you have a car, you have a piece of land, all of this, you might lose it. So this might happen and might not happen. We don't know, but the fear of this taking place is always a kind of threat. It's always like, you know, uh, a gun pointed to your head. And uh, we have every single evidence, every shred of evidence to think how much politicized our judiciary system is. Uh, again, uh, Jubran Basile uh, get away with uh, standing side by side with Bibi Netanyahu with Hanin 
actually did not, even, even when she didn't talk to an Israeli. So basically, uh, it's, it's the Lebanese in, in, in Bahrain and UAE find themselves in a, in a very, very uh, tough situation that needs to be addressed as loudly as possible and, and to be discussed in, in all practical means possible. Thanks, Nadim. Now, Hanin Radar, as uh, Rob has already mentioned, um, you know the anti-normalization laws and their impact having been on the receiving end of them. Um, and uh, so you know a lot about how they work and as you've often pointed out, how they are used to target specific people for reasons that may not directly relate uh, to Israel or Israeli-Lebanese relations. So give us a sense uh, from your uniquely or unusually informed perspective uh, of what exactly these laws are doing politically uh, within the country. Yes, thank you, Joseph. And uh, thank you, Rob. And uh, great being here with Nadim and, and Maj, definitely. Uh, to answer your question, uh, Joseph, the thing is that this, uh, this law, these laws that Maj talked about, they are no longer a legal tool. They're becoming, they're becoming a political tool in the sense that they are using selectively against certain people that you, they start as, 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 as a tool for political threats, for character assassination, for discrediting anyone who is critical of the authority and mainly Hezbollah because Hezbollah is the authority these days whether Hezbollah or its allies. They, are, have, they have been used repeatedly, repeatedly as a political tool to target opponents. And the problem with this, like in my experience, this happened to me in 2004, uh, 14, when I was in a conference uh, in DC with the Washington, Washington Institute, but I was still in Lebanon. It wasn't, it doesn't matter whether uh, I actually communicated with an Israeli, which I didn't. I was not even on the same panel with an Israeli, but there were photoshops putting me on the same panel with Ehud Barak, and I wasn't even there. And they basically accused me of being part of an, a conference that hosted Israelis, which in a way, not sure if it breaks the law or not, because there was no direct communication, and Maj would, would, would be able to explain that. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter, because what they do is they take an incident and work around it, use this, these laws specifically to go around the content and around the person in order to make sure that one, uh, you are discredited. The problem, the problem with this is that people are afraid, right? So even if the accusation is inaccurate, when they repeat it and repeat it and go start a campaign, media campaign and social media campaign, people either start to believe it or they become afraid to be associated with anyone under this accusation because it's, it's scary. And the, the mere suspicion that a person is a normalizer or an Israeli agent is perhaps the most prevalent tool of character assassination, right? And with, without a trial, such campaigns can lead to actual assassinations. And here we cannot really forget the recent case of, of Luqman Islim who has been a, a victim of character assassinations, many threats, using this law as a political tool to target him, discredit him, and then eventually this was translated into a, a, a physical assassination. It's a tool of violence. These laws are mere tool of, tools of violence. They are not used for anything that would actually protect the, the, the national security of, of the country. They have nothing to do with anything that really uh, 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 empower Lebanon's uh, foreign policy or protect Lebanon from any kind of danger. They are tools of violence, full stop. They are tool of oppression. That's what they are. And today they are used as psychological and physical threat, uh, physical violence against anyone who is clearly criti critical of Hezbollah. And you can see today in the streets, with, even after the demonstrations in Beirut, when people started to become more critical of Hezbollah, everybody is very careful, not to mention Hezbollah by name, right? Everybody's talking about everyone, the political elite, and no one wants to mention Hezbollah by name because they know that this tool is going to be used against them. And Luqman Islim's assassination was a message to everyone that 
you, we will kill you. And not only we will kill you, we'll justify killing you by saying that you broke this law. And people believe that. And this is the most dangerous part is that they discredit you and, and really go after you and justify killing you even after they physically kill you, right? So this is the main issue with this. This is violence. So this is becoming even more important at this point as Lebanon gears up for parliamentary elections of 2022, which are a major crossroad for Lebanon. And this is basically now everybody is, the, the, the civil society, the political activists who are coming, trying to come together and form a strong uh, alliance against the political elite and, and basically Hezbollah as the authority. Everybody today knows that once they become uh, um, uh, serious opponents, once they become uh, credible, and once they be, feel that they have the chance to actually uh, make headways in the elections, they will be under danger of either character assassination or physical assassination using these laws as background. And this is the main issue. It's not legal, it's political, it's a violence tool. Thank you, Hanid. So, and thanks to all three of you for really walking us through how deep and pervasive and problematic the anti-normalization laws of Lebanon are for people who live inside the country and beyond its borders. Now we're gonna do another round and begin to explore the question of what can be done about it. Um, before we do, I just wanna to mention to those of you who are seeing this and curious to ask questions of our guests, that there are two ways to do it. One is to post your question within the Zoom box in the uh, Q&A section. And the other is to send an email to policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. Now to the question of action. Uh, Majd, let me begin by asking you this. Within Lebanon, um, is there a critical mass of people who are not only fed up with the anti-normalization laws and deeply concerned about them, but also willing to actually do something about them? Uh, if so, how does one grow their numbers? And what are the systemic tools, the, the tools of actual civic activism that might be available to them to begin to address this problem? Thanks. Uh, first of all, this is a taboo subject. Um, it, it's hard to talk about it. Every time a politician or an activist living in Lebanon hears about this topic, they immediately hit the brakes. For example, when I got the invite to come here and talk, I had to do uh, to inform the partners at our law firm. I, I immediately saw the, the change of expression in their faces because I'm participating in this. Uh, let's start by saying our objective is not to cancel or uh, not apply the Anti-Normalization Act. Our objective is to protect the Lebanese people that are at risk of prosecution on a daily basis. Uh, regardless, let, let's say it frankly, if we are hacked, each and every Lebanese gets hacked on Facebook or on social media outlets, someone will find a link, direct or indirect, with someone living in Israel who or who had direct or indirect contact with someone living in Israel. So we are all at risk. Uh, to be frank, <clears throat> addressing the subject in that manner does not help, uh, help rectify or rectify the mistake, basically. Uh, this law should not be separated from all different Lebanese laws that are uh, not compliant with human rights laws. It's a package when you talk about anti-normalization act that is being applied in an arbitrary manner you cannot forget to talk about the gender equality laws uh, you cannot forget uh, to talk about the rights to bear arms in lebanon for example there's a party in lebanon that has the right to bear arms there's another a whole other population that doesn't have that right so it should be packaged within a set of rules and regulations that should be addressed simultaneously we cannot address a single manner especially a manner that is that much polarized within the lebanese society uh, i'm gonna go back to nadim here and the 300,000 lebanese people living abroad um, if we do not show the direct effect of these, the way these laws are being interpreted, we can never start to raise awareness in Lebanon. 
uh, we need Nadim and everyone living abroad to talk about the day-to-day -day struggle with these laws, how they are walking into a minefield, ev uh, into a minefield every day we have to deal with an Israeli national or a company that has shareholders that are Israelis. You guys have to be our advocates here in order to modify and to make that law more precise. That's all we're asking for. Um, we should ra raise awareness in media outlets, and this is where they come in. Ideally, we have to modify that law. This is where the legislators come in and play a major role. The modification of that law should be uh, towards making it more precise. Uh, the legislator should tell each and every Lebanese what is an infraction and what isn't. This is the ideal situation and the ideal scenario. We have another proposition, which is to create a help desk. A help desk, one, for businesses in the UAE, for businesses in Lebanon, uh, to contact that help desk and extract a legally binding opinion uh, for them to be protected later on from any prosecution. S same for individuals, individuals who get contacted by Israeli nationals on social media outlets, uh, individuals who get uh, sent friend requests, etc., should declare that invitation or that contact to that help desk in order to protect themselves. Right now, we have no protection and we are at risk of prosecution on a daily basis. Uh, if we want to talk about the internal action, we should raise awareness, talk about the day-to-day -day ramifications of the wide interpretation of the law, uh, talk about the, uh, the, the effect it has on the economy, on the Lebanese economy, on the 300,000 Lebanese families living abroad, and the effect it has on human rights and the liberty of each and every single one of us here. Ideally, you, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that international, this is a matter of human rights. This is not a matter of politics. Once we go, we dive into international politics, we will never get anywhere. This is a matter of human rights. The principle of criminal law is for each law to be precise for the person breaking the law to know when he's committing an infraction and when he isn't. The rankings of Lebanon on the human rights watch uh, meter is very helpful and our international partners should try to fund the help desk I talk about. Um, and again, the ranking of Lebanon because we have a law that's being interpreted that way should be on the bottom of the scale because we are all at risk. Every Lebanese citizen with a Facebook, Twitter, Instagram account is at risk. Everyone who has studied abroad is at risk. Everyone working abroad like Hanin and Nadim are at risk. So that's it. Thank you, Majd. And Majd, which you, the points you've just made are a nice segue uh, for us to ask a similar question of Nadim. Uh, Nadim, obviously, Majd is referring to the importance of raising awareness uh, about the issue of the law and perhaps the potential of doing something about it. Uh, he's also noting that um, Le Lebanese in the diaspora, whether it be in the Gulf or the West, have freedoms to act uh, that people within the country do not. Um, so let me ask you from your perch in Abu Dhabi, first of all, what contributions in terms of media, whether broadcast, print, or social media, might be made from there? Um, what is the role of the Lebanese diaspora in the Gulf or elsewhere in supporting the kinds of activities that Mejd is talking about? And for that matter, what might the UAE as uh, the sort of architect or co-architect of the Abraham Accords do to push this process along? Thank you, Joseph. Uh, uh, if you allow me for like one minute before I, I delve into your question, uh, uh, even, I mean, the, the, uh, the scope to which uh, the anti-normalization are willing to, um, to use the laws and the character assassination, uh, we will astonish you. For example, it's not only if you communicated with, uh, with an Israeli. If you are retweeted by an Israeli, then you are uh, uh, being, uh, uh, you know, attacked, uh, you are being smeared, <laughs> and uh, 
there is a campaign that is orchestrated around your figure, your image, your, your standing, your ethics, uh, your nationalism, everything. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, like, and, and there is a, a recurring sentence in, in the uh, um, in the replies to people like me, Hanin and Majd, is that, like, had we had a judiciary system, people like you would rot in prison. I've heard that and read that, like, zillions of times. Like, not only the law is there, but they are demanding there is like an appetite for stricter laws, uh, more forceful, more uh, 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 tightening laws, so people like Hanin, me, and Majd have really, uh, not second thoughts, probably five or six times thinking before they do or say something. This is very important to say. I mean, the climate is... Uh, regardless if the law is being uh, applied uh, forcefully or not, but the climate around this topic is very poisonous. And this is a very important point to take into consideration. Now, uh, back to your question, and I'm sorry if I deviated a little bit from that. Actually, unfortunately, there is, there is too little that the UAE can do as a state. Um, uh, first of all, this is... Uh, a Lebanese internal issue in in which the UAE are keen not to interfere or uh, try to alter the dynamics in 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 any in any country, let alone Lebanon. Uh, especially these days, that Lebanon is not on the radar of many GCC countries. Uh, number two, in terms of the media, it's it's a very much of a niche topic with a niche market. Like it, it affects only. Uh, a couple of thousands or a couple of hundreds of thousands of Lebanese, which is basically not that sort of audience that Pan-Arab stations would be really, uh, 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 you know, um, eager to talk to or, or to, to communicate with. So it's a niche market, niche, niche topic. The, the, whole, the whole burden, the majority of the burden lies on uh, the Lebanese diaspora and the GCC and abroad because uh, these these are the state, real stakeholders. These are the people who are affected by the laws. These are the people who are affected by uh, the implication or the the implementation, sorry, of, of these laws when it comes to their like you know uh, well-being, fortune, work, job, whatever it is. And I think the bridging between the UAE and the people abroad, like in in, in the West, uh, could be a very uh, uh, useful venue. Why? Because uh, the Lebanese diaspora uh, is very well connected with uh, uh, political institutions in the West. And um, what the UAE is unwilling to do, probably Washington or Brussels or Paris or London is willing to do, like to interfere, to, uh, uh, to pressure the, uh, uh, the le legislative system in Lebanon to uh, alter the laws, uh, they have so many tools to do that, including sanctions. And I think if we look at Iran, Iran will give a very good example on how things can be, you know, pushed in that sense. Uh, I think the judo game is a very prominent game in, 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 in Iran. And because of pressure, uh, Iran has to or had to alter the, the law of the, uh, the body that, that regulates the judo game in Iran because they were like banned from participating in some in, in, in many uh, activities as Iran as, as because of certain laws and certain certain phrases and articles in, in, in the law they had to change that uh, to be eligible to play in the, on, on the international level now they created a parallel mechanism by which the Iranian athlete uh, concedes or or, or uh, uh, I mean, not not refuses to play, but if he thinks that he will, the next game he will be playing against an Israeli, he will definitely lose the current game, so he will not be, you know, uh, in, in the line up to face an Israeli. So they, they created their own mechanisms, but what's important is that they had to alter the law and delete the articles that banned the Iranians from playing against Israelis. So if Iran is pushed to do that, then Lebanon must be uh, pushable in that sense to do what what they have to do. Uh, we need to study the Iranian example. Why why they were uh, 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 pushed 
what what made them concede on that on that very uh, you know ideologically sensitive uh, character of, of of what happened uh, and probably use it uh, in, in the Lebanese context. Thank you, uh, Nadim. Now, Hanin Radar, uh, Nadim has actually helpfully mentioned the role or the potential role of the West. And as you know, we've seen some interesting activity over the past year uh, when the Arab Council for Regional Integration, which is concerned about these laws, first went to the French parliament and called for a law to protect those who run afoul of the anti-normalization laws. The French parliament respond, responded with a lot of enthusiasm. And now we see here in the US, 160 senators and Congress people supporting a bill that would do something interesting. It would instruct the secretary of state to report annually on instances of Arab government retribution for uh, civil peacemakers. So clearly there's some movement um, on both sides of the Atlantic to address uh, the problem posed by these laws. Can you um, broaden that a little bit for us and tell us you know, how that can, can lead to something of a snowball effect and what other measures can be taken, particularly here in the United States? Yes, of course. Um, I will talk about three things. One is this, this panel, and it's, it's, it's a good start because we need to start talking about it. There are a lot of people in the international community, I realize that they do not really know the details of this. They, a lot of people do not know about this law. They do not know about the repercussions of this law on freedom of speech and Lebanese activists and Lebanese expats. So every time as a Lebanese who is in a context where I have to ask, you know, all the time if there was like an Israeli present or not, they, people do not under, very, many people do not understand. So what we're doing now is a good start. And this panel and the, 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 the Alliance Lebanon, the Alliance for Lebanon that we're trying to, to, to form with uh, Joseph's uh, Center for Peace Communications, this is a good start in order to one, bring uh, um, awareness about the slow, the repercussions, raise the voice about why this is important and what's, what's, what should be done. Uh, in terms of accountability, I think, you know, when I talked about Luqman assassination, Luqman's assassination uh, happened, and until now, we're still waiting for uh, uh, the investigation of, 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 of what happened. He was killed in a unifil uh, area. Uh, he was uh, killed five months ago, and until today, nothing. Nobody knows anything about the investigation. Nobody knows anything about, it's like the, 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 the Beirut port investigation. Every local investigation will get nowhere, and we've learned this from the past, for all the assassinations that happened, except for the Special Tribunal of Lebanon, which highlighted some technical issues, there was nothing. So if there was no accountability, this will continue. The character assassination will be translated into physical ass assassination. And this is something that the international community can help with, the, the, the UN, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the US, the Europeans, they all have some kind of leverage where they can really it's really about political will, whether there should be, if, if you leave it to the Lebanese authorities, there will be nothing and there will be no accountability. So my, my one of the main suggestions is the international investigation and international accountability has to continue. Uh, unfortunately, something that the STL today is in danger and this is not supposed to happen because this is the worst message you send to the Lebanese people today that justice is actually not important. So if the Lebanese are not paying money for the STL, there has to be another way to find the funding because this is this is the message that needs to be sent accountability and justice thank in you practical terms, sorry in practical terms and more like specific terms when we talk about using the leverage right so the u.s example the u.s main leverage in lebanon is the uh, army right is the lebanese army they the assistance uh, uh, to the lebanese army and this is very important because part of the lebanese army institutions is the military tribunal and the military tribunal really is the one that goes after people when it comes to these particular laws and the, the, the national security, because it's a, they consider it as a matter of national security. So it's really under the jurisdiction of the military tribunal. So this 
kind of leverage that the U.S. have with the Lebanese army needs to target this and not by case by case. And I know that in my case, this was brought up and the leverage was used, but it should be really like more of a broader strategy that not only certain people should not be targeted, no one, not a single civilian should be targeted by the uh, uh, military tribunal. The whole military tribunal job has nothing to do with civilians. No, no civilians should be under its jurisdiction. So this is something that the assistance to the Lebanese army should uh, 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 incorporate as, 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 a, as, a, as a policy. Uh, there are other things that can be done, but these, these main, main things uh, would send a very good message and would really stress accountability, justice, and civil space. Thank you, Hanin. We're seeing uh, quite a few questions coming in. I'm going to issue one more reminder that those who would like to ask questions of their own can either fill them in on the Q&A section of uh, Zoom or write to policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. Before we get to them, I'd like to uh, actually turn this back to Rob and ask you for your reaction uh, to what you're seeing here. Do you, what do you have to say about all this? Well, first of all, I'm uh, um, I'm quite uh, humbled at the idea that we have such uh, courageous people who are willing to speak up on this. I, I fully recognize that uh, uh, we've set this up so that uh, no one is breaking any any law by participating in this event. Um, uh, 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 but um, but I think we should all recognize that even talking about this event this way um, is uh, is going to uh, get under the skin of certain people in certain power centers in Lebanon and elsewhere. And so I think we should recognize that we have some courageous people participating. Um, secondly, um, I think it is very important that there is um, uh, action in capitals like Washington and Paris and London and, and elsewhere that recognize the importance of people to people exchanges and that supports it, not just with incentives, um, uh, um, which are essential, but also um, uh, that lets it be known that there will be costs to be paid to those who um, uh, place obstacles in the way of something as, as naturally human as a human connection. Um, I mean, we're not talking about uh, um, uh, uh, pol politicians um, uh, uh, negotiating back and forth. Um, I mean, we're talking about uh, uh, regular people interacting with regular people, be they um, scholars or artists or or historians or or actors or 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 musicians or whatever. Um, and the idea that that some people are trying to to criminalize this for to score political points is something that I think is absolutely right for our legislators, our polit our policy system, and those of uh, you know fellow democracies to to stand up for. Um, um, and uh, um, uh, uh, you know, I just um, I'm, I'm glad that we're able to 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 give a platform to this, and hope that this begins to generate um, you know further further effort, further discussion. Um, uh, uh, and I think this is a, a very important step forward. So, thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, let me put the first of these very interesting questions I'm seeing uh, to Mudged. Uh, from Stephen Daniels, who's interested in the sort of technical workings of this uh, in terms of the courts themselves. And he's asking, where is the sort of brunt of the authority or the power here? Is it more on the side of prosecutors or is it more on the side of the judges? Let's say that prosecutors work on their own. Um, uh, when they see something or something is reported by the military or international uh, internal security forces, they get to act. But in Hanin's case, for example, and, and any other case, for example, they uh, people get to file lawsuits against people who are suspected of acting. Prosecutors get to act, but even if they don't act, there is a possibility of the public action being launched by individuals, directly or indirectly. For example, if you have a problem with your neighbor, if you have a problem with your spouse, if you have a problem with anyone, you get to launch that prosecution against them. Let's bear in mind one thing. 
that being accused of being an Israeli agent by any public administration, by any, uh, let's say, military or paramilitary organization is a big deal in Lebanon. And no one and everyone will be afraid to deal with you and it will be like a black mark on your CV. Anyone can do it, prosecutors can do it, and individuals can take the action in front of other judges. Thank you much. Um, now, here's a question from Bahrain, and I think it's a natural for Nadim. Uh, Jasim Hossein writes, I was discredited and harassed by hardliners for appearing on a private, i.e. non-government, Israeli TV channel, I-24 News, on the eve of signing the Abraham Accords. Uh, it's not illegal by Bahraini law, and yet clearly unacceptable to many. Um, do you have any thoughts or suggestions for how Jasim should uh, handle this? If you could unmute, uh, Nadim. Uh, this is a very uh, important and very indicative in incident that, that Jasim is talking about. And it, it brings me back to what Rob said uh, earlier about you know, uh, uh, scoring political points. It, it actually goes beyond, beyond that. What Jassim was subjected to, what these people are doing in Lebanon or Iraq or somewhere else, goes way beyond scoring political points. What they are doing is that they are sustaining and perpetuating a certain political narrative about what nationalism is, who the anime is, uh, 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 how to deal with with uh, issues of uh, 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 resources and land and nationality and identity? It actually hijacks these these means, such as the law in Lebanon or the campaign that Jasim was subjected to. These are rational mechanisms uh, uh, by uh, that are applied and used by parties to hijack. The, the national debate and to impose a, some sort of narrative that, that serves their ideologies, their, their means, their ends, their values, uh, uh, etc. So, so basically, uh, I mean, there are people who don't want to uh, acknowledge Israel as a friend. They still see Israel as an enemy, but they see Iran as an equal enemy, uh, uh, Syria of Assad as an equal enemy, uh, uh, and there are others who, who say that, you know what, probably Israel now is a less lesser enemy than Iran or lesser enemy than Assad. So, so basically, uh, th these, these debates are, are taking place in the Middle East, especially in the, in the aftermath of the Arab Spring, where people saw that, that for example, uh, in, in the last war in Gaza, uh, Almost 211 uh, uh, people, unfortunately, missed or, or, or lost their lives, and this is a huge uh, loss in in, in in human in any human scale. But again, and I'm I'm sorry to, to to try to quantify death, but again, if you look at the scene in Syria, these are people who Bashar al-Assad will kill uh, between 8 a.m. and 8 uh, 8:30 a.m. Right. So why, why people killed by Assad are not, uh, or, or Assad killing this amount of people doesn't qualify him as an, an, an enemy to the Syrians and to the Lebanese, while Israel killing 211 people on 11, during 11 or 12 or 15 days qualify Israel as an enemy. Again, I apologize that I have to quantify death and human tragedy, but these are uh, very important aspects to, to, to liberate the, the, the national debate on these issues. For me, Iran is not a lesser enemy than Israel. And to be very frank with you, and I'm not saying this because I'm talking on, on a venue that is a Washington Institute related or sponsored or, or in a partnership with the Washington Institute. In my opinion, as a Lebanese, do I have problems with Israel? Yes, we have practical problems that have practical solutions that are in place. Our problems with Israel are less than those of the Mexicans with the Americans, the Canadians with the Americans, probably equal to any 
problems that the Saudis have with the Emiratis or any border states. Like it's about some, some land, some resources. These are practical problems that have practical solutions. Rational people can sit together and find these solutions together. Whereas in Iran or in Syria, uh, or, or, or the Assad Syria, I have a bigger problem. I have someone who, who I'm, I'm really fighting an existential war against Syria, who is claiming that Lebanon is part of the greater Syria, or Iran that is claiming that Lebanon is part of the axis of resistance and actively is trying to change the fabric of the of the society in Lebanon, uh, uh, in particular the Shiite society. So again, these what Jasim is subjected to, what me, Hanin, and others is basically a, a rational decision to hijack the national debate in these countries and perpetuate one-sided narrative that doesn't that obviously doesn't serve anyone but those who subscribe to it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nadim. Um, there's another question now from a, a, an unnamed attendee who is uh, clearly asking something that Hanin will have a lot to say about. Um, the question is, it sounds like a lot of the concern about the Lebanese anti-normalization laws is about inadvertent contact with Israelis. A lot of Isra uh, Lebanese are up in arms about that obvious problem. Is there a prospect of a change in the law that would allow for purposeful contact between Israelis and Arabs? That is of the kind that, uh, that Rob was alluding to uh, in his remarks, Hanin. Yeah, I'm not sure I understood the question correctly. Is that, uh, can, can, can you elaborate? Yeah, I think it's, uh, the point is, for example, Medjd was referring to a question of clarification of the law or greater precision uh, yeah. about the, what, what the law, should, in other words, for people who might not be interested in meeting Israeli citizens for any yeah. number of reasons, they just want to do business in a country that has anti-normalization, uh, anti-discrimination laws, and these two conflict. Or they just want to rent a car to any Lebanese person who comes to their business in Cyprus without worrying about whether, right? So that's one type of concern. Mm. But then yes. clearly some number of Lebanese without you know, guessing how many, actually want to meet Israelis because they believe that dialogue and engagement uh, is, the way, is the path to peace. And so the question is, is there any movement or potential uh, in the near or medium term to see progress on that front uh, in terms of uh, the legal obstacles? Yeah, okay, I got it. Thank you very much, uh, Joseph. Um, I think at the end of the day, you know, like uh, we know that if it wasn't for that anti-normalization law, and if it wasn't for this using that law as political tool and a violence tool, uh, the the uh, the factor of fear will be eliminated. And once you eliminate the factor of fear, that you will be under uh, subject to retribution, that you will be assassinated physically or, 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 uh, or psychologically, if you're no longer bound by uh, this kind of uh, uh, fear of real danger, uh, a lot of people actually in Lebanon do not want this, you know, like, it's like the, the fear of being part in, of, of, of a conference where there is an Israeli, right? That would be okay, right? A lot of students who study in the West, they want to be Part of a, a, a part of this of this dialogue, but they're always looking behind their shoulder. So it's not. I think there's also a gray area between uh, purposely or non-purposely. There are certain certain area that is the majority of the Lebanese want, which is knowing that there is Israeli in the room. We're not afraid. We're not whether they want to communicate with that person or wh whether they want actual peace with Israel or not, or whether they want actual official normalization, a lot of people want to be part of the world. And really this is about isolating the Lebanese people from the world, because when we are not allowed to be part of any initiative, any conference, any meeting, any classroom where there's an Israeli there, then the Israeli is gonna be there and we're not. So who's losing? right? We are losing. They're not losing anything. They're part of the dialogue. They're part of the conversation. They're part of the global 
uh, dialogue with, on, on, on every single aspect from art to politics to, 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 to anything, while we, because of this fear, are refraining from participating in anything. And this is one of the major, really, areas that needs to be targeted in this law. In terms of the technical issues, whether there can be this kind of shift, I think Majid will, Majid will, uh, will be able to answer this uh, better. But I think it's necessary to make, bring back the Lebanese into the global conversation, global communication. And it has nothing to do with national security and has nothing to do with, 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 with uh, uh, peace or, or, and, or politics. It's really about being part of the world and not being isolated. Thank you, Hanin. Uh, before we begin to wind down today, I'm going to ask one more question, which I think is, is quite suitable again to Majd. Um, the author writes, we've talked a lot about the ways these laws have been used to target critics of Hezbollah, but to what extent are they used in non-political cases? Are their laws being exclusively used as a means of intimidation? And when I put this question to you, Majd, I'm going to remind you of a very interesting moment in our conversation yesterday when you talked about uh, inter-family disputes and disputes among business partners uh, and so on. So what do you have to say to this question? Uh, perfect question, indeed. Uh, there's, you know, there are instances where this law was, was used properly. Uh, you have the case of General Karam, who was proved to be an Israeli spy or an Israeli agent and was sentenced using that law. But I have to say again that the biggest cases that we've all heard of, Hanin, Nadim, and myself, relate to political cases. Let's remember Tufi al Hindi, who was an anti Syrian uh, activist who was sentenced to around two years imprisonment. Let's go back to King Al Khatib. Uh, let's go back to uh, each and every one of us being at risk of being called into questioning every day. Uh, this, this law has been used legitimately uh, and I believe it should remain because we are in a state of war, whether we like it or not. Regardless, this is not a matter up to us legal technicians, uh, but this law is being used badly, uh, badly and uh, we should try to clarify it for the Lebanese people. Uh, it's being used well in certain instances, uh, Karam case, and it's being used wrongly in many other instances to apply these sanctions to political activists. Uh, if, if not, the existence of this law has been used morally to target people like Hanin, Nadim, and myself, uh, and other people as well, uh, and give a certain legitimacy uh, for uh, pro Hezbollah activists to target us with treason and with death, with, uh, death uh, threats and uh, wishes and everything else. We should always balance both. Uh, a spy should be sanctioned, an activist should not. As simple as that. Thank you, Majd. And I'd like to thank the, uh, the viewers who've been asking these uh, interesting questions and enriching the discussion. Um, as we wind down, uh, I'd also like to say thanks to Hanin for mentioning the emerging project uh, here at the Center for Peace Communications Salim Initiative, the Alliance for Lebanon, which we hope will uh, begin to serve as a kind of a hub uh, to coordinate the range of ex efforts that have been ex explored here, whether inside, in the Gulf and beyond, here in the United States or Europe, uh, to begin to really do something about these laws. Um, I'm going to sign off and turn to Rob uh, to conclude this uh, policy forum as he feels is suitable. Well, I just want to uh, thank everybody, thank all of our viewers around the world. Um, uh, and I know that uh, um, I've already received uh, notice that we've had uh, uh, enormous uh, viewership from uh, all over uh, the Middle East um, uh, and, and elsewhere. Uh, and I really want to thank uh, our panelists. Um, um, these are tough topics. These are topics that are that are that, that have real repercussions. Um, this isn't just a, um, a hypothetical issue. Um, this isn't just a distant policy issue. 
these are um, these are issues that affect people's lives. And so, I want to thank you very much, Nadim Kutesh, uh, Majd Harb, and Hanin Khadar, uh, for joining uh, with uh, Joseph Browdy and me um, for today's event. And I hope this is just the first of a series of, of discussions and events that we can have that focus on uh, um, uh, how we can make practical change to um, to get rid of the obstacles um, and that make life simpler, more uh, clearer for for all of you and for your, uh, your countrymen and women. So thank you all very much for joining us at the Washington Institute today.